Look at this, and then just the glacier at the background there. Unreal. Oh, that's all uh, from mining. How do you see down there? Backwards? No, backwards. Backwards. more the easiest way. Yeah. Two percent of the copper that is currently in use came through this building and out of those wow. mines. In the world. Two percent of yeah, all the copper. Yeah, two percent of the world. All the copper in the world is being used right now. Morning internet, it is 8.30 in the morning and welcome back to the channel. Welcome here in McCarthy, Alaska. Now today I'm going to ride to the abandoned copper mine, which I was wanted to go to in the last video, but then everything, well, I, I hope you saw the last video, and I don't have to explain everything that happened then. So I'm gonna go there this morning, have a look around, and then I'm going to continue. So now I'm right over here. So I have to backtrack over the same road and then I'm gonna go, well, I have to go towards Anchorage to have um, that fork seal repaired. But today I wanna end up at the Man Mat Matanuska. Matanuska Glacier. And then after that, um, I will continue to Anchorage, but at least I'll be on my way, kind of in the right direction to hopefully some repairs. <coughs> Let's go to the abandoned copper mine. I really have to conserve my fuel because the fuel station that I was yesterday didn't have any fuel. And yeah, that means uh, I have to get back all the way, well, possibly all the way back to the hub, which is where, you know, where we worked on the fork. Luckily, I filled up that extra, <laughs> that extra fuel container. So I chucked that in the main tank when I arrived here. It is another gorgeous, gorgeous day. How about that? Let's appreciate this incredible Alaskan weather. Pretty awesome way to get to the abandoned mine site. Just by this little road. How cool is that? So before those prospectors discovered this copper ore deposit, the First Nations people that had been living in the area for a long time before, they already found copper in the area and they actually found an area which had 100% copper. So those were copper nuggets, basically. They didn't have the smelting techniques, but if you have 100% pure copper, they could just warm it up and then shape it in, well, any, any type of shape. So they'd have copper jewelry and I don't know what else they, they really made from it. So that there was copper in the area that was known. The Kennecott Mines. And here, look at this. And then just the glacier at the background there. Unreal. Oh, that's all uh, from mining. How do you see down there? Impressive size, right? So actually, this is all glacier. So the glacier runs all the way down here. And it's just brown because it's all moraine. So there's just dirt and gravel on top, but that's actually natural. So that has nothing to do with the mine. Where, we, where I'm standing now, this is actually built on top of mine tailings. So this is all mine and well, obviously everything down there. But all that you see there is just 
natural and just all coming off the glacier. Here and there you can see a little bit of white, um, but even under that dirt there's just blue, blue ice. So all of these buildings were all part of the mine and they've all been restored. Oh, well, they, they maintain it. Oh, wow, look at that. This is amazing. So I'm first going to ride around a little bit and then uh, see if I can get into the buildings with a guide because I can't go on my own. Look at this. Straight from the 1900s. Oh, that roof its collapsing a little bit. They had record snowfall here last winter too. So uh, some of the buildings, they uh, need a lot of repairs. See some old uh, train tracks here on the side. this off to our right you see the two-tone mountain that is Don that's Mount Donahoe okay the big white one back in the back that's Mount Blackburn the mountain range that is across the valley there that mountain range out there yep. that is the Chugach mountain range that big white mountain over there yeah from th this perspective looks to be closer than the Chugach mountain range yeah it does it's not they're the same distance. They're both about 27 miles away. That mountain is over 16,000 feet tall. Those mountains are 8,000. It's funny how the brain tricks you then in thinking that. It is absolutely yeah. amazing. On the other side of the valley, there is a small pass that comes through on the north side of Mount Fireweed. That is called Fourth of July Pass. Right. The reason it is called that is the, the legend says that when the prospectors were coming through looking for the source of the copper, they were trying to find it and they came through that pass on the 4th of July. When the copper here was discovered, they had the mines, the mines brought all the material down, they processed all of it and refined it down to, you know, through mechanical and uh, chemical processes to where they had essentially pure copper ore. Then they would package it and ship it and run it down their train line that the yeah. company built yeah. A 200 mile long train line all the way down to Cordova, load it on steamships, and then take it to Tacoma. Where's Tacoma? Uh, Tacoma is in, near Seattle. Ah, okay. Puget okay. Sound. Right. So, here we are at the top of the mill. The mill was built on the side of the mountain so the gravity could help with the processing of everything, right? Right. Gravity's going to let it all drop. It makes it easy, requires fewer pumps, fewer lifts. Yeah. Everybody it makes life easy for everybody. They used an aerial tram system. There's the remnants of one right there to bring ore buckets from the mines down to the mill to be processed. Gravity pulled them down. They didn't have to motorize the thing. All they had to have was brakes. Yeah. So, you know, efficiency definitely was at its best. So, National Park Service requires that we t uh, talk about the this warning. Oh, yeah. All right, so caution, heavy metals such as lead, arsenic, mercury, copper, zinc, chromium, cadmium, and barium are consistently present in elevated quantities in the mine tailings and soil, as well as other places throughout the mill site. These are harmful to your health and especially to children under the age of six and pregnant women. Really simple, don't lick rocks. I'll try. So we're gonna go inside and get out, uh, get our hard hats. <laughs> As far as the engineering is concerned of how they built this place, I mean, think about it. They built this place in less than four years. There was no train coming in. So everything was built here uh, originally, initially, it was all built by strength of back and ingenuity. These huge cable lines that run thousands and thousands and thousands of feet up the mountain, how much do they weigh? Yeah. Like, the, it just, it's mind boggling. They are anchored into the bedrock up at the top it comes all the way down here and then it goes over this thing right here it is not anchored to the bedrock down here there is a giant basket 
full of rocks <laughs> that holding is it keeping down keeping this tight wow. which if you think about it it's actually brilliant this was the other line the other the other line came in and you can see that giant wooden you know basket you know oh, it's probably oh, yeah there, yeah it's yeah, probably probably yeah, two meters yeah, by two there, meters yeah. by i don't even know how tall yeah okay just full of rock yeah you know and that's how they kept the cables tight as far as views this spectacular this oh. is where the views are yeah okay from here you can clearly see mount donahoe yeah if you hadn't realized already donahoe is a crocodile okay you can see his eyes up there on the top oh, where yeah. it's gray yeah it comes down you can see his <laughs> snout that pops up yeah okay you know he's he's a crocodile or yeah. alligator depending yeah. on where you come from there was a worker, his job was to stand there, and as rocks came down and hit, if it didn't fall through, it was his job to smash it with a sledgehammer <laughs> until it fell through. And make it fit. Make wow. it fit. Okay, now the, the shifts out here were 8 or 12 hours long, depending upon the specific time period of operation. Yeah. So there's a guy who stood there for 8 to 12 hours a day with a sledgehammer smashing rocks. Why do you think they called that thing the grizzly bar? The guy standing over it probably looked like a grizzly bear. A huge dude. Absolutely massive. Because I mean, in my mind, I just picture some, you know, giant, burly, like, you know, Swede or <laughs> Norwegian dude with a huge sledgehammer just smash, smash. Do you have any idea, like, at the time, what, what would the wages be? Of so wages here okay. for just unskilled labor were about $5 a day. Right. Okay. Uh, skilled labor would go up to about six dollars and fifty cents a day. So a sledgehammer guy would make probably only making five. Mo only making five. I've been told that that's almost twice what he would have made down in San Francisco, right. working manual labor. Yeah. So yeah. the wages up here were actually we're very good. The work here was, you know, it, it had it had to be a terrible place to work. Yeah. Okay. This is our first stairway. It's one of our best. This was the first place in the mill where water was introduced. Everything uh, above us was dry. Yeah. Okay, right. down here we have water. So the ore would have come down onto two shaker assemblies, which these are very sad remains of what was here. We have a much better example of one downstairs. Right. But this is where they would start sorting the ore, okay, based on weight. So from here, we're gonna go downstairs. Now this is the worst ladders we have, ship's ladders. Oh yeah, okay. those are They good. had to take out the good stairs that we used to have here because they added a whole bunch of structural uh, members to help shore up the building a couple of years ago. Backwards, no that problem. was by far the easiest way. Yeah, all right. Well, good thing I worked on ships for a long time, so. <laughs> oh, well you're an old hat at this then. <laughs> The big difference between one shaker and the next was the size of the screen that was in it. That screen, um, you know, the, the finer or smaller the openings, it was just for separating material. Now the way yeah. this machine worked is the ore would come down through here in a slurry. Yeah. This uh, line would be spraying water down onto it yeah. and it would shake like that. Okay. Very, very rapidly. That one moved at 180 RPMs. So it must have been a really noisy room. Can you imagine how noisy this place was? <laughs> Upstairs, you've got two rock crushers. You've got yeah. the giant Swede with his huge sledgehammer. You've got two of these above us yeah. and two here. Yeah. And it just gets louder the deeper we go. Yeah. This building had to be absolutely deafening. You, you must have, like, from the, across the valley, you probably could hear it. Legend says that they could hear the mill in McCarthy oh. all year long. Now, in this room, this is the first place where we get to see a heater. There was our heater. Oh yeah. <laughs> that heater, really, the purpose of heat in this building had absolutely nothing to do with employee comfort. The only reason they had heat in this building was to keep the water lines from freezing. So, going down from here, this next room, we have the two largest crushers that are in the, in the mill. All right, now these crushers were not these crushers came in on the train. They were not here when the mill, during the initial construction. The legend says when the train showed up, it unloaded all a bunch of people, it unloaded a bunch of materials, equipment, lumber. They loaded it back up with copper ore, and three days later it left, full. 
It was yes. insured for $250,000 in copper ore. That was the most any insurance company in the world was willing to insure. Nobody really knows exactly how much copper ore was on it. They know that it was more than a quarter million dollars on the first load and it left three days after the train first got here. These two machines here, these are two different types of crushers that were used in the plant. Okay, once these were installed, these became the, the heavyweights for smashing big rocks into little teeny rocks. It was, it's basically just two drums that are rotating like this. Yeah. Okay, and they smash the rock between them. Now, to adjust the drums, the gap between them, yeah. that's what this giant cog was for. They were trying to make rock, they're trying to make the rocks small like these guys. Yeah. That's the size they wanted. You could spend years yeah. studying this. I imagine. Um, they actually, as we go down, I'll start pointing out some markers to you, that some placards that have been put on in, yeah. in the building. There was a couple of locals, um, one of, actually one of our guides many, many years ago, uh, an engineer and a couple of park service guys that went through and they spent months going through this building, yeah, trying to, to figure understand out how it worked, <laughs> how everything worked. And they tagged and yeah. labeled everything as they went down. One of them was a mining expert, you know, and even he couldn't and, and immediately. it took them months to figure out yeah. how everything worked in here. How they did it. So the cool thing about these machines is they were run by those giant canvas belts. Yeah. That's how these wow. machines operated. Um, yeah. They would have an electric motor up there running the drive axle. And then they would have multiple pulleys, multiple um, flywheels based on, they would get them the gearing ratio that they needed to run the equipment. This thing would have, would have had rock sliding down it yeah. in water, like so loud. All right, now here's the other kicker about these two machines. All right, I want to say, and I forget which, one of these machines weighs over 30 tons. We're 150 feet above the road. Yeah. How did they get it up here? Yeah. Train brought it in. Yeah down at the bottom of the hill, yeah. and then they built a track assembly and a huge winch, winched these up the side of the mountain, and then brought them through that door. You can see the tracks are still on the floor Oh yeah. that they rolled these things in on. Yeah. Now, between these two machines here, vibrating and making noise, the shakers we've seen upstairs vibrating yeah. and making noise, everything here is moving. Now, this building is the largest freestanding wooden structure in Alaska. It is the fourth largest freestanding wooden structure in the world. The, now, what that means is it doesn't have a concrete foundation and it doesn't have a steel frame. This whole building is built out of wood, literally on the side of the mountain. Shaking violently, but... <laughs> exactly. So at some point, at, while they were using, while they were working, Somebody realized, hey, we got a problem. This building is starting to fall off the mountain. So their solution was they went and added a retrofit at that point, which is it's kind of difficult to see because the sun's shining through the window. It is these things right here, these giant right, turnbuckles. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's several of these that go from the mountain down all the way around the building on the other side and back up. And they and held it back. They back held on this it back. Place. The National Park Service tells us that this was the wrench used to adjust those. I don't know about you, but if you look at this thing, I mean, my hands are kind of big. Nice little tool. <laughs> I would hate to be the guy who has to work this. Now also, you can see the square hole at the bottom. Yeah. That was for turning bolts. Right. Like that. Like. <laughs> Maybe this was also a sledgehammer guy was doing this. It, it might have been. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Let's come down what here, is this? You'll be able to see. There's just, I don't know where to look. There's so There's, much yeah, going I, I, on. So the ore is coming down yeah. from the chutes above us. Yeah. And then it's coming into this machine and then there was two there's two more over here that are just like it this box moved in what's called a circular square pattern right okay so it would have it would have gone over up over down this guy was moving i want to say it was either 180 or 200 rpms very very uh, rapidly yeah very very noisy our ore is coming down through here with water and then landing in here then as this machine is doing this 
what it's doing is it's tossing the gravel up. As it tosses it up, the limestone is light enough to yeah. where it would start jumping from one basket to yeah. the next, working yeah. its way down the line. The copper ore is heavy enough where it won't bounce as much or as far, and it's gonna be able to drop through Sit the holes. There. When they shut down the mill, this gravel well, it's just still laying was, here. was there. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Uh. Now here we also have a heater right here, but this one makes it real obvious. The only thing they're worried about is the plumbing. And this yeah. heater, its only purpose would have been to yeah. keep these pipes from freezing in the middle of the winter. And then looking out, you can see all the pulleys that are on these drive axles that were running equipment. Yeah, yeah. You know? Oh yeah, these were those belts? Yes, yeah. yes. You can see this belt right here yeah. was, was running something over there. Yeah. And this would have been a flywheel. Yeah, these are both flywheels. Because wow, I don't see what this would have run to. There is so much going on. Like, yeah, how, how do you how do you even start building this? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. The, it's like the, every every inch is, is in use for yes. some sort of Yes. Yes. And they didn't thing. they obviously they didn't do anything for like comfort. It was purely yeah. everything all functional. Yeah. Yeah. You know. But yeah, this was this was the workshop, you know? Wow. They had a pretty nice view up here too. Oh, the views are amazing. Yeah. The views are amazing. I love this building. The yeah. craftsmanship that was, the craftsmanship in this building is absolutely amazing. Yeah. For the guys that built it. Yeah. Like all these, all these boards that were cut, like that was a handsaw. Yeah. That did all of these. Yeah. They might have hand drilled all of these bolt holes. Yeah. Like the majority would have been hand drilled. It's yeah. just absolutely amazing when you start looking around at the joinery, you yeah. know, and it's like, these guys did this in Alaska, 200 miles from the ocean. Yeah. There was no town here. The town was building as they built this place. And they worked on it all year long. Like, they didn't shut down in the winter when it got cold. No, like, just kept on going. Just keep going. And here we are, 110 years later, and it's still standing. Yeah. And it sat yeah. abandoned and yeah. neglected. Yeah. For the better part of a, a century. So here, we're going to start seeing our shaker tables. There's several floors of these tables. Okay, now these shaker tables work just like a gold shaker table. We've all seen those on yeah. TV. As the table moves, the, the slurry gets dropped in that corner yeah. through a pipe. Yeah. Okay, clean water would get dropped into that through a pipe. And then as the table is shaking, the operator would use those little um, diamond-shaped things. They, called a do they were called dogs. He yeah. would twist those to adjust the water flow out on the table. Yeah. And the water would wash the limestone off and allow the copper to make, it, to make its way to the end of the table and drop into the catch over there. This huge thing, if you look down, oh, wow. would have come in behind horses or dogs. dogs. In no the way. And then assembled. And then assembled on site. We've noticed everything is run by drive belts, right? Yeah. All these belts are coming off of the same common axle. Yeah. So one motor is yeah. running all of these machines, okay? Now this entire floor would have only had one technician running all of these machines. What I could do is as this belt is being driven by the axle, I grab this handle and I could just simply pull this over. Huh. And the belt would slide onto this wheel. Yeah shutting the machine down so I can do the maintenance or adjustments and then when I'm ready to put it back on line I just push that over and it would slide back onto the drive wheel and keep rolling. So as far as the amount of copper that they found here in these mines because they were so large and so rich that as much as two percent of the copper that is currently in use came from came through this building and out of those wow. mines. In the world. 2% of yeah, all 2 the copper. Yeah, 2% of the world. All the copper in the world is being used right now. Yes. Okay. Now, the reason it's such, it, that it is that number is copper is so easy to recycle and it is so common to recycle it. It's not like it's, you know, consumed. Yeah, exactly. And so once it's been pulled out of the ground, it pretty much gets put into the pool and is getting used over and over and over. You go demolish yeah. a building, you recycle the copper up. Okay. The, and from there, it would then be bagged in used burlap coffee bags. That seems a bit random. Well, 
Well, nothing is random in this place, so... Several months of the year, this place is frozen. If I go and take all of this copper ore, and I fill, like, a big train car full of ore, yeah. what's going to happen? It's going to freeze. freeze. Yeah. How am I going to get it out of the train car and onto the boat? Yeah. So, what they did is they bagged it. You can see they would use oh. old burlap coffee bags. <laughs> Amazing. They would fill them full of ore, stitch it shut, and it, they can yeah. unload it yeah. when it gets down to Cordova. So they would have pulled a lever, been standing here, yeah. fill a bag up with copper ore. Yeah. You imagine how heavy this bag is, full of rock, and then stitch it shut. There was a, con you can still see the remnants of the conveyor belt assembly. Yeah. They would toss it on there, and then it would go down the conveyor to the storage yeah. uh, so that when the train came in, they could just load the train yeah. and send it out. So yeah, so the trains would just come right here. Yep. And then right through here. straight be loaded up with the bags. There would have been guys, when the train came in, there would have yeah. been guys standing up there, filling bags, yeah. dropping it onto this. This would be out onto the train. Yeah. And they would fill bags and stack the train here. Yeah. That you can see oh, yeah. is the train loaded wow. with bags of copper ore. Yeah. Okay. It's like six, seven layers tall. Mm -hmm. yeah. We also had mishaps like that because the ground in, in Alaska, okay, if it is not really rocky, it's yeah. really boggy. That's a train that got snowed in. Yeah. We're gonna head down the stairs. Okay. And bang a left and go between those big old tanks. So at the time, early 1900s, they would use acid leaching to pull the copper out of the host stone. Yeah. The problem is with this limestone, it dissolved both of them. So they could not acid leach here like was being done in other areas in the world. As far as efficiency and the amount of copper they were able to get out of the, out of the rock, mechanically, they were operating at about a uh, you know sixty to seventy percent efficiency rating. Right. Okay. That's where this comes in. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the way this worked is over on that side they had tanks that would they they would put the tailings that had yep. been mechanically separated. They would put those tailings in. They would then fill those tanks with ammonia. All right, and they would heat it, and they would they would leave it there for days. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then after that after the specified time period the ammonia would be pumped out of those tanks and into these tanks. These tanks would then be heated and the ammonia would be boiled off, leaving just the copper ore inside the tanks. Uh -huh. So it was some guy, some lucky guy's job to go... Oh no, inside? <gasps> unbolt it and go inside and scrape all the copper from the inside. <gasps> Like, yeah, what health, what health, health hazards came out of it? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. They would boil off the ammonia, okay, and they then it would go through all of the equipment above us, where it would be uh, condensed and right. then reintroduced back into the process. Yeah. Now, obviously, they had a lot of leaks, like you see that old yeah. number up there. That's yeah. that bright teal. Okay, that's yeah. copper. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's where ammonia was leaking. You look at these tanks. You can see this is copper. Yeah. That's copper. This is where ammonia was leaking out of these tanks. So this, then, so then what was the efficiency then? It, including... it took the efficiency up to the low 90s. Right. Depending upon which literature you're looking at. Yeah. Um, there's, there are, there's literature that uh, is out here saying anywhere from 90 to 95% efficiency by adding this process. Wow, that was incredible. Just walking through a 14-story copper mill building from the early 1900s I mean so now it is time to go I spend a lot of time here it's uh, almost one o'clock now and I think it's still a five-hour ride back at the footbridge or motorcycle bridge where all the cars have to stay on the other side. <laughs> and back over the Copper River. It's a bit of a scary, <laughs> scary drop, look at that. 
amazing. I just came from those mountains over there. Yes. Is it petrol or is it only diesel? I think both. This is very good. How's the fork seal? Huh? How's the fork seal? It's still up? It's still up. You're shit, man. Oh, this, I, I haven't checked it the last bit, but this morning it was still. Yeah. <laughs> A bad place. So Alaska is tucked in for the night. <laughs> Look at this view from here. Oh, it was an, another incredible day. Uh, I thought it was just so fascinating seeing that mill and just hearing all the stories. So I also hope that you liked the tour around there. Um, and then yeah, it was just a nice ride. Um, I had planned some some more detours, but well, I couldn't do them for two reasons. First was that I was running really low on fuel uh, because I couldn't fill up um, in a previous video. And the second was that I don't really want to go too crazy with yeah, only one fork left basically. So I first need to uh, fix that. But uh, anyway, it was a fantastic day. Really enjoyed it. So I hope you liked it too. If you did, please give me a big thumbs up, subscribe down below, and then I'll see you in the next video.